Senator Miwa, thank you for joining us today. Thank you for having me. After nine years, you have decided to not seek re-election. What precipitated your decision? Well, when I got elected nine years ago, um, I always uh, knew that at the most, I would probably be here, you know, 10 or 12 years. Um, I felt like it, was a, it would be a really good chunk of time to um, gain some concrete um, experience um, and then to take that and, and go do something else with it. And um, this year when the term came up, uh, my husband and I thought about it and we at first thought that we might go through the re-election for the next two year um, term for the cycle. Um, but then, you know, Julie, you know I have a fourth grader and in two more years, my fourth grader will be a sixth grader. And I think transitions are a little bit easier on a fourth grader than it would be on a sixth grader. So um, actually, uh, our children uh, made the decision for us in terms of when, whether it's this year or two years from now. Was your caucus surprised at all with your announcement? Um, they were. Um, and in part, I think, um, I felt like it was a decision that my husband and I had made, along with our children and the rest of our extended families. Um, and I wanted to be respectful of that decision. Um, what I was afraid of is that if I told people, um, I think there would be a number of people who would try to talk me out of the decision. <laughs> so um, we just sort of kept it, uh, uh, once we made the decision, we just kept it uh, among us. And then um, I informed my caucus um, a couple hours before we went up to the chamber. It surprised many inside the Capitol as well, outside of your caucus. Now, you've been such a strong voice in raising potential profiling concerns, especially with the now defunct Metro Gang Strike Force. You work to provide financial relief for some small farmers in your caucus. Now, what do you consider your most significant piece of legislation? Oh, you know, it's hard to point to a specific um, particular piece of legislation. Um, but I have to say that there are areas um, you know, that you've touched on. Um, when I became chair of the Senate Judiciary Committee um, four years ago, um, I identified four areas that I really wanted to spend um, the next four years working on. Um, and so you, you and I have talked about some of those things. One is the whole second chance, right, having to do with reentry and collateral sanctions and collateral consequences for criminal records. The second area was children and youth. Um, in particular children and youth who are in the juvenile justice system. Um, the third area is thinking about how we could do domestic uh, violence or prevent domestic violence um, and prevent domestic abuse. Um, we could do programs around that area better. Um, and then the fourth area really um, was human trafficking. How can we think differently about trafficking in this state? And were you able to reach your level of expectations in those areas with legislation that's been passed, or are you disappointed? Um, I've been very pleased um, on a couple of levels. I think that despite um, the tremendous downturn in the economy and how um, ever since I've been here at the legislature, we've gone through successive cycles of budget deficits. So even though you know there's supposed to be budget years and policy years for those of us who are interested in policy to be doing policy work, it's felt to me like every year has been a budget year. Um, and yet despite those focus, we've been able to focus attention and bring attention to these policy issues. And incrementally, we've been able to put in place good um, foundation pieces of legislation. Um, so um, I'm very pleased that um, from a practical policy level we're able to make some incremental changes um, but more importantly I think we've been able to spend um, the last four years building um, the public will on these issues and it's my hope that even though I'm not here um, what will sustain those issues will be the public advocacy and the public will around these issues. You're the first Hmong American elected to the legislature in the nation. So after this many years of in office, has the real significance of that hit? Or do you think it might when you step down? Um, I am starting to feel a, li a little bit of that um, now as I um, go about the work in the community, um, not only within the Hmong American community, but um, among the Asian American community um, nationally. Um, it was a pretty significant election. Um, 
uh, from an Asian American um, political identity perspective. And so, um, you know, lots of people are really happy uh, about my decision and happy for me, but I think people are disappointed too. Um, um, it's, a it's a statistic that will no longer be there. I think I shared with you once that outside of um, Hawaii, uh, I'm the only um, Asian American woman state senator on the mainland. And so, you know, um, even though here in Minnesota, I'm just this little short Asian woman bopping around the state capitol, um, when you look at demographics and statistics, that was significant. And so given that, are you concerned that perhaps the voice of the Asian Americans, the Hmong Americans, the Hmong Minnesotans could be lost, not just here at the capitol, but perhaps even statewide or nationally? Well, there's always um, that um, concern um, in the backdrop. But if I've done my job right um, in being the, the bridge builder that I intended to be, um, if I've done my job right in um, establishing relationships with my colleagues here at the legislature as well as among my friends um, nationally, um, and if I've done my job right um, by inculcating a culture of political efficacy among not only the Hmong American community, but the Southeast Asian community and the large Asian American community, um, I hope that that won't be the case. Um, because um, some of it is um, practical application and practical practice. Um, and what we've offered through my office is an opportunity for members of those marginalized communities who historically have thought that um, access to this building um, is closed, um, now have had almost 10 years of practice uh, knowing how easy it is to pick up the phone and make a phone call. Um, so I hope that the public out there, not just the Hmong American community or not just Asian Americans, but you know, my office has a point, been a point of access for the African American community, for the Latino community, for the American Indian community, really for marginalized communities. And it's my hope that the last years of practice have given them enough confidence, enough practice that even without me being here, they could pick up the phone and call their own elected member. So what's next? Um, I have taken the last um, couple of weeks to just recover from a legislative session. Um, been having a number of conversations with uh, different friends and allies. Um, you know, it's been 10 years, and um, I'm just taking the next, uh, the last couple of weeks and the next couple of weeks to reflect and to think about where I'm at and um, what is something that I would like to do that I could continue maybe to build on the work that I've done here. Um, but I, you know, I, I think that anything is possible. And so it's been, um, it's been really fun and exciting to think about what the next um, adventure is going to be. Do you think you could find yourself back in public office somewhere down the road? Maybe. You know, I never um, uh, shut out possibilities, um, just as I never planned that I would end up here at the Minnesota legislature. Um, you know, I never um, would shut out a, a future opportunity. Um, that being said, um, it's been such a tremendous honor to be a Minnesota State Senator. Um, you know, for all the reasons that you've talked about being the first, uh, being very highly visible. but. I mean, if you just think about the number of people who have actually been a state senator um, here, there's, at, in any given year, there's only 67 of us. Um, and what a tremendous privilege to have been a part of this institution. Um, so if I never end up in public life again, um, I think I would feel like, you know, I have been given uh, such a great honor to do this. But if the opportunity comes up and, you know, there are, um, different ways to come back and be in public life, I think that it would be really fun too. Well, we of course wish you well and want to thank you for coming in during the interim to talk about, talk about your future. Thanks so much. Thank you, Julie.